I will start because he's busy drinking. Thanks for tuning in to another video on both uh, Forgotten Weapons and Bloke on the Range. We are uh, here in Switzerland and I was coming over and figured, well, we should get together and film something. An excellent idea, sir. And drink something. Indeed. So we have uh, Glen Roth's Alba Reserve, a Speyside single malt. So, which you brought. Thank I did. you very much. Pleasure. This should be very tasty. It is indeed. No. Nothing better to go with uh, scotch than discussing obnoxious gun myths. <laughs> <laughs> something my channel does quite a lot. <laughs> and something that continuously irks me. So, so many things. Of, how did this nonsense get so stuck in so many people's heads? And here we are dealing with myths 75 years after their creation. Mm -hmm. There's something weird about the way that information was distributed, well, pre-internet, yeah. that if it got in the right place, it could get sticky. And you just, we still today never hear the end of it. And it's still sticky. And a lot of these single sources, uh, you go to Wikipedia and they've got some information that you think is a bit myth-like, a bit iffy. You click through to the link and it's one of these sources yes typically. <coughs> so um what do we want to start with let us start with that famous one the one that i have flogged to death and times <laughs> already on my channel and had my colleague the chap running in and out of the range from around my uh, my previous fiat well top italian car to go with my top italian m1 <laughs> You beat that one to death, and so I don't have to. Exactly. There Thank we you. go. Taking one for the team. This is, of course, the myth of the M1 ping. The idea that uh, the M1, of course, makes this cool, distinctive ka-ching noise when it ejects its sheet metal clip when it's empty. And it is well known that this will get you killed by the Japanese, the Germans, the Koreans, the Chinese. I think that's pretty much everyone that we fought. Well, we, the Americans, fought the M1. But absolutely, it'll get you killed on the streets, yeah. right? Unless you're super clever, at which point you can, according to comments under my videos, you can tap it on your helmet, or throw it at your helmet, or throw it on throw rock. It rock, or I've heard that one. the floor, or throw it on the rifle, is another mm. one. The other one I heard Sneaky. is that you can tap your mug on your helmet. <laughs> that was a particularly silly one, given that your mug is in a pouch underneath a water bottle. So I'm not quite sure how you get to it. And uh, I tested this by tapping a, an aluminium mug on my <laughs> helmet and it doesn't go ping, it goes dunk. <laughs> and then someone in the comments was very, very irked that it was a Swiss Army mug and not an American one. <laughs> that I'm sure makes a, com a total huge difference. Yes. So of course the idea is if you make that ping noise when you're not out of ammunition, the enemy will inevitably uh, jump up from wherever they are and go to kill you, but you'll be able to get them by surprise. Yeah. There's so many things wrong with this. I, yeah. you, well, you know where to start. You already okay. start, middle, and end on this. Yeah, well, um, let's, let's start with this. Um, if you're close enough to even consider hearing the ping, you are in the middle of a pretty serious firefight. And uh, let's just say that a, a week or so ago, when I was distracted by filming, I forgot to put my ear defenders on <laughs> and I fired around a 308 from uh, my, my minty Spanish Mauser. That was a mistake. Beep. One round. Yeah. Imagine you've been firing that rifle a lot and other people are firing rifles at you. There's supersonic cracks from bullets passing relatively close. How close are you going to be? A lot of people say, oh, you could be in a building. That just makes it worse. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If I fired a gun on an indoor range, yeah. even a pistol's noisy. Yeah, and if you're in a building, maybe there's a decent chance that the guy in front of you has a Thompson submachine gun that he's touching off in there, too. Yes. Um, um, so, yeah, the first problem is no one's actually really going to hear that thing in combat conditions. Mm -hmm. And then the second problem is the idea that, let's say, somehow magically they do, they're going to jump up and get to you before you can reload? Or before your buddy who's next to you? Because this, I mean, this, this isn't Call of Duty on the Xbox here. Wait, what? Did I? Sorry, I went there. Was that a game? I thought that was like a, a, an accurate reenactment of the entire war. Mm. Oh. Well, that would explain a lot. Though. That would explain a lot. <laughs> 
uh, I can reload an M1 pretty darn fast. Yeah, we did a few a few shot to shot trials on various videos, and apart from a few comedy fumbles I left in the videos, we were looking at four to six seconds, a fumbly one around six seconds, a nice clean one from a pouch. I mean, people accuse me of doing it from a table or something, but it was from a pouch. Rip open the pouch, whack it in, tap the bolt forward. I mean, this is bang, ping, bang, at that sort of rate. Yeah. You're not running very far. The idea that you could get out of a, a hidden position or a covered position and cover any substantial amount of ground is ludicrous. The whole thing is ludicrous. Yeah. Who even came up with this stupid idea? The first written reference to this that I found, and I crowd, I did a video specifically to crowdsource this, and I had some, sorry, I can't I'm awful with names, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Red Josh, someone suddenly comes to mind, provided me with a whole list of links to Second World War era, Korean War era, lessons learned documents, sort of sharing the knowledge where, where soldiers would would, would write tips and tricks of how the enemy operate, how we can operate better, has all sorts of things like, office, in one there's even an officer bemoaning that the men are not using their slings even when they could, because <laughs> who'd want to tie themselves into a rifle in combat and limit their movement? Anyway, we have found the earliest reference, and uh, strangely enough it's the one mentioned by Wikipedia as wow. the source for this. So remarkably, they sort of got something right, although Wrong, but they got the best. They, they got the best the, source. They got the for the wrong fact. Yeah, the the, the <laughs> right source for the wrong fact, and it is uh, Roy F. Dunlap. Ordnance went up front. I'll be honest, that made me a little sad because there's some really good, interesting information. Roy there Dunlap's is. a cool guy. Yeah, and it's a shame to discover that he's the one who started this nonsense. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of interesting stuff because for those who haven't come across Roy Dunlap, he was a gunsmith in civilian life. And at the start of the war, he joined the U.S. Marine Corps, and he spent part of the war gun plumbing, and part of the war as an infantryman. He was just on, mm -hmm. on one of the islands. He landed as an infantryman. He'd uh, he got his back up about something. I thought it was Saipan. It might be Saipan. It's in here somewhere. I'm sure we. Can put it. But then he went on to North Africa. I think um, North Africa was first. Okay. I think he was there. He was there first. He and then he he, yeah. he got his back up about gun plumbing and decided he'd just be a normal uh, infantryman for a while. So his. The things he experienced personally um, are quite interesting. There's all sorts of stories about maintaining rifles in the jungle with uh, guys being left in, in contact with the enemy too long, corrosive ammunition, um, the, M, the M1, gar, gar, rifle yeah. M1, <laughs> Garon, I even got criticised yeah. for that once. Should, apparently I should be pronouncing it in Quebecois fashion, which I'll <laughs> attempt as uh, Garon. Sure, anyway. there we go. Anyway, um, but particularly, the, the, the M1s were particularly adapted to deal with corrosive ammunition. The, 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 the piston head is stainless, the, right. the gas piston is stainless, uh, the gas plug, I'm not sure, certainly the early the early the gas plug ones doesn't got, really matter that got, much. got problematic, but the BARs were apparently horrible, right. absolutely horrible. And they weren't well suited to corrosive ammunition and maintenance, in, the first in addition place. to being horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very mean opinion there, <laughs> Mr. McCullough. Oops. <laughs> anyway, um, what Mr. Dunlap? Yeah, the thing about Dunlap is he really knew his stuff. Mm. He was a professional gunsmith, and when he had hands-on personal experience with some of this stuff, he was writing really insightful, interesting yeah. things. Normally, when you get this sort of first-hand account, it's from a guy who is just a basically a volunteer or a conscript infantryman, and I hate to say it, but most of those guys really didn't know anything about the guns that they were using. And so you get these first-hand accounts that take one anecdote and extrapolate everything mm -hmm. from it, where a guy like Dunlap knew enough about guns to recognize what was relevant and what wasn't. The problem comes when he starts talking about things that he didn't actually see himself, yep. but heard someone else say. Yeah. Um, so this seems to come page 294 for those who wish to acquire the very tastefully bound book. Da, 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 da. So, I shall politically correcticize this. The Japanese, on Guadalcanal, learned that the ping of an ejecting M1 clip meant a momentarily empty rifle, and American infantrymen died because of it. Aberdeen was in a slight furor for a while, trying to silence the noise, make plastic clips, etc. There's two problems with this. One, he wasn't on Guadalcanal, as far as we can find. Right. And if I've interpreted his dates that he's mentioned in here correctly, he was in fact in North Africa when 
the campaign was being fought in Guadalcanal. The second thing is that if Aberdeen had ever made any form of plastic clip, even as a one-off, people would be 3D printing them. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm sure some website somewhere about weird obscure guns would have had one of those classic Aberdeen pictures of their experimental yeah. three of their experimental plastic clip. All of the Aberdeen experiments from this period, from the banal up to the crazy stuff where they modified an FG42 to take a belt vertically and all those other crazy prototypes. An M1 that takes two clips. You know more than me. I've seen the rifle, they did that. Cool. Yeah, but they didn't make plastic clips. No. I don't even think there's enough room for plastic clips made by the plastic technology of the day. Yeah, that would be... Yeah, well, well, they didn't do it. Yeah. It's a fantasy. He made it up. Well, he didn't make it up. He probably heard it from someone yeah. who he thought was an authoritative source, and so he repeated it in his book, uh, but no. Now it's all over Wikipedia. It's all over everywhere. It's all over books, as I read as, as a kid in the pre-internet right. days, repeated over and over again. Um, and it's, it was even brought to the attention of the US military, and we know this, right. because there's a 1953 off the top of my head, uh, sort of survey lessons learned document done by the US Army uh, post Korea mm -hmm. dealing with the various aspect of various weapons. Do we like this? Do we like that? Should we have one BAR, two BARs, three BARs? Why should we have two BARs? Because one of them is going to be out of action at any one time, people thought. <laughs> huh! Weird. But Weird. we know it was such a fantastic firearm. Um, things like that, bayonets, uh, uh, M1s, and there are there are two specific things relating to the M1 and noise, and they asked a sort of false dichotomy question where they give two options that aren't really necessarily related. And that it was, uh, is the M1 ping an aid to remembering to reload? Because, I mean, if you're panicking, on a range you feel the difference between the recoil, right. you feel that the, the, the bolt doesn't go forward, it feels different, but if you are... Um, paying more attention to the enemy than to your own rifle. Yeah, you might not notice it. Um, and quite a few s answered, yeah, it's a, it's a nice little... It, it, it's loud enough when it's right in front of your face. Right, and to, it's this visual cue. Yeah. The thing comes flying out of your gun. Thank goodness for the chain, because I wouldn't have noticed. I wasn't counting. And so they asked, is it an aid to knowing you're out, or is it... Um, a hindrance because the enemy take note of it. And now, it wasn't Zero that said, no, we think it's a hindrance because the enemy take note of it, but the vast majority were saying they either didn't care or... And honestly, the guys who said, yes, it is a problem, that's an example of those first-hand accounts that are unreliable. Because what probably happened is they had a coincidental, I fired my last round mm -hmm. and the gun went ping, and right then, the other guy came around the corner. Or popped up. Or right, whatever. and they're, they're accounting... Uh, intent to something that was actually coincidence. There's a lot of coincidence, particularly when you've got a lot of events happening and there's a lot of confusion and you've got tunnel vision and... And your life is literally on the line. You're going to... You're going to very vividly remember things that seem to be important. Yeah. Um, and the other one regarding noise, though, was the safety catch. Yeah. Now, the safety catch on an M1 is particularly noisy. It kind of is. It's, it's a click, but it's a pretty loud abrupt click. Yeah. Well, the, the sort of the whole of the, that part of the receiver is kind of hollow and there's a metal plate over it and it's got a big, heavy, powerful detente on it so yeah. that you don't accidentally knock it off. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, it's the era of people walking around with their fingers in the, in the trigger guard. So they put a big fat spring on that. But that big fat spring means that when you push it forward, when, when, when it goes over the little, little cam hump, mm -hmm. it goes, book! Yeah. Actually quite loud. Um, and there were a surprising number of people who responded, yeah, actually, this is kind of a problem because in an ambush situation when all is quiet, if suddenly you've got half a dozen plus guys going click, 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 all, all along one side of a track, I, see, that is plausible. Because yeah, it is. You're not in a firefight. There's not bangs going off all over the place already. Um, if you the enemy is deliberately trying to listen for signs of people yeah, coming around. The, in principle, un unless you've been in a firefight in the, in the few hours previously, you're not got ringing in your ears or, or any of the other problems. Uh, that seems a lot more plausible. And indeed, if I remember correctly, more people answered, yeah, that's an issue, than answered, nah, don't worry about it. Yeah. So, uh, so thank you for what well, you and your viewers for tracking down the origin point of this really obnoxious, persistent myth. If anyone has a written trace earlier 
and I said this on the, on the video when I crowdsourced it, I, I really want to find out about it. My, generally, my, my, my policy is it's not about being right or wrong, it's about ultimately finding out what the truth is. Absolutely, yeah. And then saying, okay, cool. And if it means you change your mind, you, you, you change your mind. There's not gonna. There's very little chance for much earlier than that, because that was written in forty six. Forty six. We didn't really start actually using the thing in combat until forty one, forty two. Yeah, and unless there's another lessons learned magazine that didn't come out and right that isn't listed under under my under my video uh, where I, where I crowdsourced this, then this must be patient zero. <laughs> For, for those who are into pathology. Yes, that, I think that's an excellent metaphor there. Mm. Yeah. Now, should we uh, use Dunlap to segue into number two, which is possibly his, uh, his fault as well? Go for it. So apparently the uh, Bren light machine gun is too accurate. Oh, you mean the Bren sniper rifle? It's an automatic sniper rifle. Oh, yeah, because they wanted to put a scope on the side and everything. Yeah. The Japanese, yeah. yeah, you just single load it. Because yeah. the magazine's in the way, and you can't see your sights with the magazine. Oh, yeah, so you single load it, and it's basically a sniper rifle. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Too accurate. <laughs> um, that is one that I also hear all the time. It's repeated that, yeah, the, the Bren was not an effective machine gun, because it was just too darn accurate. Yes. My weapon is too accurate, said no one ever. <laughs> now, you fired a light machine gun. I fired uh, a, a commercial Bren and a real... Proper brand. I've fired a bunch of light machine guns. I think anybody who has actually fired a light machine gun will understand and recognize that this story is complete horse hockey. Because you cannot, even if it was, let's say it was an actual literal laser beam, perfectly, exactly the same place every time, the bouncing around that you get from a light machine gun when you fire it will give you a nice open cone of fire. Yep. It is... Just, I, you know, the M1 ping, I think, has some level of mm -hmm. plausibility to it that, well, I guess if you didn't really think about it, you could see how that's true. Mm -hmm. The only way that this Bren gun being too accurate myth is even remotely understandable is if you have never fired a light machine gun before. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you brought up a really good point when we were discussing this earlier, mm -hmm. that if it, even if all of these things were, were wrong and it was too accurate, there's a very simple solution. Just hold it looser, and it'll bounce around more, and you'll get a wider cone of fire. Yeah. Now, once again, you have done way more in-depth research on this mm -hmm. than I have, and you dug up uh, one of the British training manuals. A bunch of them. Yeah, which talk about what they were actually trying to go for with the Bren, and it was it was accuracy. Yeah. Um, this here is the 1948, so it's the post Second World War. I've got a, a bunch of others from the early days. Why does that not surprise me? <laughs> you think I'm like yeah, yeah I'm like that. Um, so what was interesting to me uh, as a little diversion it's sort of, it's it's not only about the weapons themselves it's how they use the ergonomics of them the ergonomics of carrying things for them and uh, I've been working on uh, in fact I have a uh, uh, Ausbildungsvorschrift für die Infanterie German. Uh, it's a, basically a training pamphlet for the infantry, which has got a load of um, MG34. Um, uh, it was a bit early for it's 1941, so it's still MG34 doctrine. How it was, how the rifle, the weapons were used doctrinally, mm -hmm. how the ammunition is carried. That sort of the ergonomics of carrying the ammunition. This this stuff fa fascinates me. It um, also shows that one is a huge nerd. I find it fascinating too. <laughs> In some ways, it becomes more interesting than the guns themselves fairly quickly. To a, to a certain degree. Because that's a lot of what dictates how the things were actually used. Yeah. Um, even if there were variations from them, and, and most of the armies would, would modify their techniques as they, as they went along. I mean, if you, if you look at uh, uh, the British LMG manual from right at, at the adoption, they've got a completely different distribution of ammunition around mm. the section than, than later. And then this one here, 1948, is the, the, the sort of distillation of everything they learned during the Second World War, and uh, it's also a lot longer because the, the the Second World War pamphlets tended to be a bit shorter. Of uh, uh, quick, get it all printed and out to people so that they can they have to have time to read it before they get shot. Yeah, so 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 the the post war ones tend, manuals tend to be rather more extensive, rather more information on them, and and they make the point that 
It does have an arrow cone of fire, which means you have to aim it properly. You can't count on just this, this random burst effect hitting your target for you. Yeah, yeah. Effectively, you want what you want to hit at the center of the cone of fire. And interestingly, there's notes on zeroing them, whereas rifles in, the, in, in British practice, unlike German practice, rifles were zeroed to the individual, Okay. provided they could shoot at least an 8-inch group, which isn't that impressive, but this is, we're talking a conscript army. I think we'll, we'll get into some accuracy yeah. in a moment. Um, but the Bren had to be zeroed so that any member of the section could fire it and it wouldn't be too far off unless they were personally too far off. It sort of had to be zeroed for an average for an average man in the section. And they were individually zeroed. I mean, MG42s, there's no provision for it. But the cone of fires, kind of, yeah. I did a bowling pin shoot with a, well, it's an MG3 mm. actually, mm -hmm. at 100 metres, and the cone of fire at 100 metres was ever so slightly larger than the bowling pin. <laughs> so I should do three and four round bursts that were splashing like the side of the bowling pin. Um, but doctrinally, uh, they expected a good shot with a Bren on single shot to shoot four inches. Okay. Which is... That is really quite good. That's basic. That's only a little bit less accurate than a sniper rifle. Yeah. In um, fact, the, the British sniper standard was three minute. Yeah. Well, two and a half. Five inches. Right. That's yes. 200. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and, um, um, but four inches was the above average standard because the, 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 the British gauged grouping standards to gauge how good people were. You were either a four inch grouper, uh, an 8 inch grouper or a 12 inch grouper and if you weren't a 12 inch grouper you had to keep doing remedial training <laughs> until you were. You were in the kitchen. Yeah, because until you could group to 12 inches you couldn't keep all your shots reliably on a 48 inch target at 300 yards. Which okay. is what they were, what they were looking for. Um, but once you, uh, once you switch the lever to fun it just goes way out the window and I haven't got the right manual with me but the, uh, the spread when fired in bursts of a Bren is wider than a Vickers. Which makes perfect sense because the Bren's fired off a bipod. Mm -hmm. The Vickers is fired off of a very heavy, very solid, yep. and very precisely adjustable tripod. Mm -hmm. The Vickers is the one that, if any of this myth were true, mm -hmm. you'd expect it to be true about the Vickers, where you would imagine, and this I can actually see some plausibility in, because mm -hmm. on a Vickers tripod, that gun's locked in place. Yep. And so you don't have the ability to just freely swing it like you do with a light machine gun. Mm -hmm. And I can see it being someone being, I can see someone complaining that the cone of fire is too small and it's, I have to be turning knobs and adjusting wheels in order to move slightly to hit my target. Mm. But you don't hear about that. In fact, you hear nothing but praise about the Vickers. So where this concept came from is... Well, according to Wikipedia, in a bored moment, I was looking something up... Uh on Wikipedia, and it repeats this, Bren, Bren, Bren gun is too accurate. Reference, click. Oh no, Dunlap again. Dunlap again. again. <laughs> oh, no. And he says that the, 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 the lightweight Mark III and Mark IV Brens were intended to improve the cone of fire by having shorter barrels, whereas they were lightweight versions for being lightweight. Being lighter, yes. For airborne and stuff. And then, when they converted them to 7.62 NATO post-war, they put long barrels on them. So, uh, irrespective of what the receiver was mar you know, marked up as. On a complete side note, this is also uh, a hint that, uh, a, a good case study in one should not take other, take things at face value that one does not actually know. Mm -hmm. if, if, see, the thing with Roy, Roy Dunlap is, if he had ever actually done any serious shooting with a Bren, mm -hmm. he had he had all the knowledge and experience to be able to give it a proper assessment and yep. understand that this notion was complete bollocks. Yeah, you're starting to get me using British terms. I was, now. was, I, was I was impressed. <laughs> I was impressed. I'm very impressed. Yeah, it's, I mean it's it's, um, it's it's a shame. There's so much interest. It, buy the book. Yes, read the book. Buy the book. Read the book. It is it is a brilliant book. It's it's fascinating. It's memoirs and technical information. But then he's got a photo of an MG34 that's not of an MG34. It's of the Solitum predecessor, and uh, I probably I can't find it right now. But uh, there's all there, there's all sorts of funny 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 little errors going on there. But it's worth it for his memoirs, what he did during the war, right. and then the gunsmith related stuff where he was genuinely 
expert. I mean, yeah. all sorts of fascinating things. Like uh, he landed on Saipan or wherever it was um, with a sea stocked 1903 Springfield. Which he did himself. Which he did in himself. the hold of the ship, basically. Yep, he went and, uh, and uh, found one and stocked it up properly as a gunsmith because, according to him, and this is, this is information that is entirely believable because it's well within his personal sphere and he has no reason to lie, no reason to repeat hearsay because it's the right. only thing he knows. And it's his area of expertise as well. Yeah. Uh, the, the, most, of the, most of the 1903 Springfields were badly stocked up and that's about the worst thing you can have for a rifle's accuracy uh, is a badly stocked up rifle. People forget that the, um, the, 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 the wood metal interface is the most important thing to accuracy once you've got a barrel that is of reasonable quality. And we are now going to change the battery in the camera. We'll be right back. All right. So we're back. So we're back. Where were we? Badly stocked rifles. Badly stocked bad rifles. thing. And Roy Dunlap went ashore with a, uh, a scant C stock on his own rifle because he went and found one, put it in, and did it right. Yep. Only there was a shortage of Springfield clips because we're right on the changeover from Springfield to M1s. M1s. Mm -hmm. um, so he says he went ashore with five rounds in the rifle, two charges of five rounds each in his belt, and then pockets stuffed with loose ammo. Fantastic. You know, that's the sort of thing that the official history doesn't really tell you. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. And uh, it sort of renders stripper clips non-disposable suddenly, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. You know, that's kind of like what we have sometimes today when you're trying to shoot something with weird, expensive, rare clips. And you're like, I got one. Don't lose it. Yeah, your French, Don't step on it. <laughs> your old French clips seem to be... Uh, yeah. All right. Also, I have run out of scotch. Yep. You haven't. Not quite. But, um, I will in a tick. Oh my goodness, you have run out of scotch. What a tragedy. We so, must remedi remediate. We're going through the sampler pack here. Yep. And the next one we have is a 1995, what appears to be a 15-year mm -hmm. Glen Roths. Yep. Apparently, the 1995 is no longer available in large format. It's only available in the little ones. Mm, well. So said the guy that sold it. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Cheers. That is rather nice. Subtly different to the previous one. Hmm. It's less sweet than the last one. Yeah. Let's just say this I isn't like famous grouse for the British viewers. <laughs> or well, we know what famous grouse is. Oh, you, you have to suffer famous grouse over oh, there yeah. as well. Well, if you look down at like the bottom shelf of the liquor <laughs> store. Well, in the UK, it's on the middle shelf. Ooh. Ooh. Nice uh, stuff. So, where were we? He went ashore with insufficient stripper clips. Yes. Um, One of many very interesting, cool pieces, little tidbits of, of anecdote that, when in proper context, are very interesting to read. Yeah. So, so now, the one thing that we forgot to mention um, mm -hmm. about the Bren mm -hmm. was not only did the British um, specifically... They wanted it to be an accurate gun, and they made light of the fact that it was accurate. They emphasized that when shooting it, you must hold it very tight in order to exploit that accuracy. Yeah. They were very insistent on tight holding so that, so that the group, so that the, the cone of fire was tight and was effective. Exactly the opposite of what they would have said if this too yeah. accurate crap yeah. was actually real. To the point where they were still teaching a very oblique position with the rifle, but they were teaching a very straight-on position with the Bren, so you get behind it, get your toes into the dirt, and and yeah, I mean, the one thing, the only one thing I don't like about the Bren is that bipod should really lock. Because mm -hmm. it, it sort of locks. I mean, an MG42 bipod is just a horror. It's just, <laughs> it's just this floppy, horrible piece of pressed steel. And it's sort of, if you're, if you're shooting it off the bipod, you've got to choose where do I start leaning the bipod? So is my burst going to track high right. or low, or is it going to track high then low? <laughs> and you've got to choose one. I mean, you've got, you've got three buttons. And you, you often see in, uh, in combat footage that they rest the barrel jacket on a log or something so that they don't have this thing. Right. And then 
And by the way, one of the neat things about a, gun, a recoil operated gun like the 42 is that's basically a free float tube. Yeah. Not quite. Not quite. It's... But you're not getting the deflection that you would if you were actually resting on the barrel itself. Not that it really not makes it... that much of a difference with a, a, a rate of fire like that. A rate of fire like that and a cone of fire like that and a, and, and a, and a cone of fire that doesn't even justify zeroable sights. <laughs> Um, now, now you're getting a little harsh. I think the 42 is a quite good gun. Oh, it's great. As a, as a, as a GPMG, it's super. It's, it's totally clear why the Germans and others still use it. It's a, it's a superb GPMG. Let's not get into the LMG versus GPMG thing, but... It, it is a generalist right, it is, firearm. It is. Oh. But the bipod's a shocker. <laughs> um, the, the Bren bipod half locks. You can push into it a certain amount, but if you push too far, it folds. Boop. And, and then you're... Um, yeah, that's a problem. Uh, I've, I've seen that happen on the range. Someone <laughs> lent into Oops. it and ended up with the bipod right foot. No, 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 no. Yeah. But you've got to learn just how much you can, you can, you can push into it. But uh, it's... Uh, I can fire a Bren offhand. I can't fire an MG42 offhand. These things are heavy. They're yeah. Really yeah. heavy. You could do it if you were pressed. If you were stacked like Garth. Well, if you had enough Russians charging at you. You'd figure it out pretty You'd quick. You'd work it out pretty quick, yeah. yeah. So, our third topic. Our third? Our third annoying thing that people still say to this day that is totally not true. Which particular one? We've got two. Well, we do have two. Yeah. Let's take your pick. Do, uh, let's do accuracy of service rifles in general with a few comments on particular ones that there are particular incorrect informations abounding All right. on. Now, with a, aside from a few exceptions, with an iron-sighted service rifle, bolt action, mm -hmm. or semi-auto, World War II issue, we're talking a normal accuracy of four to five-ish minutes of angle. So, for those that don't speak MOA, that's sort of four to five inches at uh, 100 yards. If you think in metric, Google does good conversion for you. Yes. <laughs> Uh, 2.5 centimeters to the inch, so 5 times 2.5, uh, 12 and a half centimeters at 100 meters. At 91 meters. 100. <laughs> Meter to yard. They're Close enough for government to work. Um, this is a standard of accuracy that in today's modern mm -hmm. firearms market would be considered one step up from pure garbage. Mm -hmm. You know, if anyone, the, the typical new rifle buyer, if you go out and yeah. buy a hunting rifle and discover that it shoots four or five minute of angle, you would take it back and demand to know why they sent, why they sold you the defective broken one. Yeah. Whereas if your Gewehr 98 or Car 98B, the long ones, shot four to five minutes of angle, it would be actually on the, towards the good side of average. Yeah. Um, this is totally normal and particularly for a conscript army where there's no massive focus on marksmanship or They're firing. not gonna hit anything anyway. Not going to hit anything anyway. Um, was slight disagreement. Me and Ian have been boring each other with agreement mostly, but we had a little little disagreement over this. My my view is that four minutes of angle, plus well, four to five minutes of angle. If, if we want to be a bit generous and allow the Italians and the Russian carbines, and let's say four to six. Anyway, to to your taste, this sort of thing. Um, normal vision is twenty twenty which is, means that you can resolve a pattern with one minute of angle. So mm. if you make a letter, the letter E on your, on your optician's chart on the 2020 line, or for those in Europe, the 1.0 line, um, the, the bars of the E have a resolution of one minute of angle. Huh, I never actually yeah, knew that. that. That's really cool. Some That's opticians probably going to say I'm wrong, but I'm, pr I'm, 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 okay. I'm pretty sure on that. Um, but yeah. Normal vision is resolving in one minute of angle. Could you, could you, at a reasonable combat distance, see a reasonable combat target that is less than four minutes of angle and see it well enough to aim at it with the iron sights of a Second World War era rifle? Well, oh, we happen to know that they were shooting, uh, the qualification was 600 meters or 600 yards. So clearly they need a rifle capable of hitting whatever I happen to think of at 600 yards, right? It's a question of whether you can see it and if it's a target on the range, if it's a target on a target frame versus an actual moving 
Hiding. Hiding. <laughs> darting. <laughs> helmet camouflaged. wearing. Camouflaged. Uh, target. That's a different. That's a different matter. It's such a different matter, and I think a lot of people. If all you've ever shot are bullseyes, it would be it would behoove you to get out there and actually take a look at some things that would be legitimate military targets. Yeah. I mean, when I shoot competition, we use we use basically silhouette steel targets, mm -hmm. but we don't paint them. Yeah. And that's on a standard dirt range and it's a fixed target we know where it is and we know exactly what shape it's a normal distinguishable shape even those targets can be excruciatingly yeah. difficult to see and that's at less than 200 yards yeah um and yeah the idea that that you're going to be firing at anything exceeding anything over 200 yards is really extremely rare it's uh, and and at 200 you may shoot at it but you won't hit it yeah. If you are a standard infantryman in World War II. Yeah. Now, that said, our disagreement is I would really kind of like to have a rifle a bit better than five or six minute of angle. Well, so would I. Because yeah. it does, as a military, I'd like yeah, to have yeah, well, it. Because it does give the few guys who are able to exploit some accuracy in their rifle, I'd like to have have yeah. that capability. We we are above average shots, though, both of us. True. And that's, and, 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 and that's the difference. And this is, interestingly, something that French got right, but that's probably a topic for another time. Um, yeah, I would love a two-minute of angle rifle. I would love a K31, particularly if it had an aperture sight. Mm. Um, but just a, just a little divergence back back to the four-minute, eight-minute, yeah. um, 12-minute 12 mi 12 <laughs> grouping standards. Uh, I, I divergence back to our actual point. <laughs> <laughs> it's... Um, it's it, it, it's they a, had standard categories for guys who could only shoot 12 minute of angle, and that's prone, right? Yeah. Um, a, friend, uh, a friend of mine who's Spanish did, uh, did his military service mm -hmm. as, it, as it was in Spain. And again, they, they, they expected with a, with a set Miel, you qualified at 12 inches, 30, 30 centimeters at 100 meters. That was, that was deemed, deemed militarily adequate. Although that's with a set Miel. So you also have to actually get the rifle to fire all the rounds. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I must have had lots of time. Um, so yeah, effect effectively, it, it also seems to be relatively easy to build a rifle and cost effective to build a rifle to a four to six, or four to five mm -hmm. minute of angle um, standard. It gets exponentially difficult to go beyond that. And we're talking with World War One or World War Two manufacturing standards. Yeah. Yeah. Today it's much easier because we have much better machine tools, um, or rather we have much better controls mm -hmm. on the machine tools. Um, and remember, everything that every gun company is making, it's making in peacetime. Yeah. This isn't wartime, rushed production. Mm -hmm. uh, it's that certainly not, you know, we're actively being bombed, carpet bombed, while yeah. we're trying to make rifles. There's, yeah. you know, your average modern hunting rifle has a lot of advantages going for it. Yeah. And... Um, we wouldn't tolerate now what was tolerated in wartime. Big problem in wartime was not the metal; it was the timber. Hmm. The, there were shortages of timber; it had to be dried. Uh, the Germans played with laminates. The Brits tried, but because the the, the thing with the Brits diversion um, is that we had at the time obligations in every single climactic zone on Earth, from the the Arctic wastes of Canada to hot and dry in Africa to hot and damp in India and the Far East, and we needed things that would work adequately in all of those. Um, and okay, the Germans had it pretty hot and pretty cold in, in Russia, but laminates, their laminate stocks held up to that. Interesting diversion on your diversion. One of the problems with the Sturmgewehr mm -hmm. was that the stocks would swell, yeah. and the recoil spring went into a hole in the stock. Oh, yeah. The stock would swell up crimp down on the recoil spring, which then couldn't compress properly, and mm. the gun would stop working. Mm. Because of the wood. Yeah. Wood is a big deal. Wood is a big deal. And uh, on a number four, the only two parts that hand-fitted is the wood to metal mm -hmm. and the bolt head. Hmm. The bolt heads were only... Yeah, just... For, an, for a normal infantry rifle, they weren't particularly fitted. For the sniper rifles, they were, in principle, very finely fitted, but then... Uh, the the big deal with the with the with the with the number four T sniper rifles is they the that they pulled off the rack rifles that did particularly well at the first stage tests. Now, this was a uh, 
a 100 feet test. Okay. Five shots from a machine rest, and it was uh, ladies that did this primarily. Mm -hmm. uh, originally with a sighting telescope, rested on, but later they just they got good enough to do it through the irons, and uh, they had to shoot four out of five shots into a one inch by one point five inch rectangle. The one point five being vertical because rifles always spread a bit more vertically than laterally. Um, and then 10% were tested at... Uh, so one by one and a half inch sounds pretty good until you realize that was 100 feet. Yeah. Which would be 28 yards, 28 meters, 30 yards. But in any case, during, yards. during wartime, the number that were tested at... Um, it, it changed post-war. Um, I've got a post-war manual that is, is quite clear that post-war it was uh, 10 of 10 shots of 10% of the rifles into 18 by 18 inches a square at 600 yards. Um, for off the top of my head, wartime, I think they tested 10% of 200, which had to go into about three or four minutes, can't remember. I'll, 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 I'll look it up and okay. send it to you, we'll put it at the bottom. Um, the, the point we're getting at here is this was the sniper rifle, and it was being held to a standard of about three minutes of angle. To a, the sniper rifles were all stocked up by Holland and Holland. Mm -hmm. They got walnut stocks, no matter what they were, any of them that did the that did particularly well in the one inch by one and a half inch test, so a particularly tight group in that. You remember, I mean, I, I rag on three round groups all the time, but five round groups aren't necessarily much better. They are definitely better, but not necessarily that much. But they, they pulled the good ones off the rack, they sent them to Holland's, and they got a first choice, good, seasoned, presumably pre-war, presumably, <laughs> um, walnut stock. They were finely stocked. For, um, they had to have a five group barrel. Two groups were rejected, okay. even though in principle there's no, there's no real difference and for the infantry rifles they had to hold the same standard. Um, but the, the, the issue here is, is, is timber and there is, aside from uh, the number fours that were free floated as a wartime emergency measure, which I believe were mostly American ones, and the lend lease ones, the, uh, the British uh, inspectors had no rights. When, when the British government was purchasing from Savage, Mm -hmm. We had inspectors in there. Uh, as soon as it was Lend-Lease, uh, no, number four Mark 1 stars were given an official US designation on paper. Because and you'll take what we darn well and, give you. <laughs> and it's cheap as free, so uh, you'll, yeah, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get it. And I don't know off the top of my head, and in fact I've never seen a reference in a book, hmm. as to whether the Lend-Lease, Savage and other US manufacturers were subject to the same accuracy standards. Um, yeah, they may not have been. They may not have been, simply because as anyone who has sporterized a number four or has got their rasp out, rasp out and, uh, and removed the muzzle bearing from a number four will know they don't shoot anywhere near as well free floated. Because with a barrel that light, they benefit massively from even muzzle pressure. And this is something I'm, I, I've mentioned in a TFB video a bit, uh, I've shown it in a video on my channel as well, and a lot of clever goes into the stocking up of making light military barrels shoot straight. The French took that very seriously, to the point that the screws that you have to take out to remove the stock, the forend on a Moss 36, have special screws in them so that you can't take it apart. Yeah. Because you, the soldier, are not qualified to properly replace yeah. that front end and, and bed it mm -hmm. correctly. And the British, in the British military, and I think the Germans as well, you were not allowed to take the rifle out of the metal because right. by taking it out and putting it back in, you are loosening it. And that is one of the unfortunate flaws with the M1 right. Garen bedding yep. system. It's on the, I'll do a video on this at some point. On the one hand, it's mechanically awesome that you can have this short little receiver mm -hmm. and, and this, and this, and this cl incredibly clever clamping system. But the problem is that every time you need to clean the rifle, and recruits will be cleaning their, taking their rifles out all the constantly. time, constantly, every time you take it out, you loosen the bedding. And at a certain point, the metal slides in the bedding. And Dunlap, actually, has an anecdote about qualifying with some sloppy, nasty M1 that shot this horrifically large group, but no one was expecting soldiers to shoot tight groups. So right. he qualified with a nasty, sloppy M1 that should have been restocked a long time ago. Yeah. Um, so... So our point is, people think that because we can make very accurate rifles today, and because you can squeeze most of that accuracy out of them without too much difficulty from a mm -hmm. bench rest at a shooting range on a nice sunny day 
that thus during World War II, people must have had the same, certainly snipers would yeah. have had the same quality and been capable of the same standards. The reality is no. Um, shoot first off, shooting in any sort of real field conditions, mm. much less combat conditions, is very different from shooting off of a bench rest. The rifles they had were nowhere near as accurate as the rifles that we produce today. And I would say on the best day, a really good sniper is, is going to have the skill level of a typical avid civilian enthusiast. Yeah, they just didn't get enough rounds. Right, they didn't do a lot of practice. The, your standard infantry uh, were either volunteers or conscripts who had minimal history with firearms. Even in the United States, where we'd like to think that we have this fantastic, great tradition of civilian marksmanship, mm -hmm. even then, well, you can go to a shooting range today and see it. Most yeah. of the people out there shooting aren't actually all that good, and they didn't get very much training before going into combat because mm -hmm. there simply wasn't time. Um, in fact, we talked about this earlier today. Mm. There's only one group we can come up with where a military really took this concept of we just had a bad experience in a war, we need good marks, seriously good marksmanship standards on our infantry, and then actually did it. Mm. And it was you guys, it was the yeah. British, for about 15 years between the end of the Boer War mm -hmm. and basically when the BEF got massacred by artillery in World War One. Yeah. Uh, those guys, it was a professional army, they had serious standards, they had lots of practice time, mm -hmm. and they had guys who were lifelong soldiers. And they were very insistent that the point of the training was to, to achieve a high average standard of shooting, not just to train a couple of show-offs. Right. Yep. So it was really, it was to get the average level up. Yep. And it showed it, because uh, in the retreat from from Montmartre. All great British ultimate victories start with a re retreat or a massacre. <laughs> and the First World War was no exception. And obviously we appreciate when, uh, when, when the Americans uh, decide that having their shipping shunk, sunk by, uh, by the Germans is not so much fun and maybe they should uh, come, come join in too. But you look at the retreat from Mons, you look at, you, you, you look at the veterans camps on both sides. The, the BEF were massively, massively outnumbered they didn't have a particularly high issue of machine guns. It's higher than myth has it. Um, but this had not been a focus of the British military the way it had been with the Germans. No, it's, it's a funny thing with the, with the Brits. We're often an early adopter. We're a very early adopter of the Maxim gun. We had mm -hmm. an awful lot of Maxims in 45, uh, 57, 450. I was going to say, you're an early adopter of the Maxim gun. You bought a Maxim gun very early. <laughs> and, a Maxim and gun. And we used them in colonial conflicts, yeah. um, massively in mm -hmm. colonial conflicts. And then, by the time World War One was running, we used, we used them fairly extensively in, in the Boer War, as did the Boers, the, to, to a certain degree. Um, by World War One, it was sort of, well, it's not cricket for European warfare, really. Right. But can you imagine giving it loads with a 577-450 Maxim? That would be an experience. That would be yeah. an experience. If anyone's got one! <laughs> the closest thing you're going to get, um, I have a... An, an acquaintance I knew who has since passed, mm -hmm. but he was working on a Maxim gun in 11 millimeter Gras. Close enough. Which, and I think he was probably going to try and get it running in 4570 as well. Yeah. If he could get the links and the mm. everything sorted, but never did. I know someone that has the odd access to Nordenfelts and things mm -hmm. in, uh, right. in the various odd calibers that yes. those were in at the time, mostly for film and, uh, and theatre, hmm. but uh, one, one day I shall persuade him to let me bring a camera along. Definitely, yeah. Um, but, uh, anyway, aside from the BEF in the run-up to World War I, nobody else put in the, the serious time and effort to create real marksmanship standards. Yeah. And then, even with the BEF, you look at the, the, the number of rounds per year issued in training, compared to modern... To, 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 to modern amounts of ammunition, it's still pitiful, but you must understand that the 250 odd rounds uh, that the, 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 uh, the pre First World War British soldiers got was masses compared to what their continental conscripted cousins got. Yeah. Like, absolutely masses. Way more than the US, too. Hmm. US marksmanship standards. A, a great one to look at is the, the, the army in the late 1800s, between the hmm. Civil War and the turn of the century. Things like the Gatling guns were often totally not used because they didn't have enough training ammunition allotted mm. to even fire them. 
it was we have so little ammunition that we'd rather give every soldier five rounds for mm -hmm. the year to practice mm -hmm. with than take 200 to let one guy get a try at this Gatling gun. Yeah, so. it's, it's, it's something people underestimate always is, um, is amounts, of, amounts of ammunition for training. Yeah. And when I was doing this preparation for, for comparing Second World War UK versus, um, versus Germans, in the Schiefsvorschrift here, um, they don't even say how much training, how much ammunition is available for training. Uh, they say how it should be split up, but they say that the ministry will tell you how much ammunition you've got for training. And the... Uh, that means not much. Not much. <laughs> uh, and they did th three types of practice. They did what's called school shooting, sort of bullseye type stuff, but sometimes on a slightly figury target, but still on ring targets. Um, uh, Gefechts, Schulschießen, so, so combat school shooting, which is not specifically defined. It seems to be something that was organised more at local level. And then Gefechtschießen, so fighting shooting, which is more in the field. But uh, the number of practices they've got here, there, and this is pre war, this is uh, 1934, with updates up to about 37, 38. It's not an impressive number of rounds, and it's an incredibly unimpressive standard of shooting required to pass. Um, not something we should... Basically, if you could get three rounds out of five in the black of the target. Okay. And about that, uh, depending on what year of service you were, at 150 or 200, then you were, you were good to go. What all we really care about is that you're able to carry the ammo cans for the MG34. Because <laughs> that's yeah. what does the, the bulk of the fighting. Yeah, and if you, if, you, if you add up, if you look at the number of uh, people in a, in a German infantry squad and add up the theoretical firepower, the machine gun has more rounds per minute than everyone else put together. Put together. Yeah. Easily. Yeah. Even firing at the, at, the, at the more relaxed rate. Yeah. Um, and then in any case, uh, just uh, to... As, as, a, as a point on gen general accuracy, and I'm sorry this is in metric... So all those who think in inches, we've done some inch stuff. It's yeah, only fair that we do some metric. Let our let our Canadian and uh, <laughs> continental uh, brothers. Um, we have a table of the of the expected accuracy of a long Mauser ninety eight, so a Gewehr ninety eight or a Car ninety eight B, and the uh, Car ninety eight K is uh, uh, not significantly larger in the spread, and uh, the Germans like and the Swiss actually as well like to like to think in fifty percent figures um, because statistically speaking mathematically speaking you can't actually define a size of a group a full group because uh, a million shots there, there's the, statistically there'll be a lot, an outlier somewhere which will increase your group so what they tended to do was say okay 50% um, of shots will go into such and such a height 50% into such and such a width and these these figures are particularly good because they have a radius as well hmm. um, so we're expecting an, a, a typical long Mauser 98 to put 50% of its shots into a radius of 10 centimeters at 300 meters, so a diameter of 20 centimeters. So that's about eight inches. Let's just round, let's just do engineering rounding. Okay. Call it eight inches at 300 ish yards. Okay. So that's, now it's about two and a half minutes. Half. That's not bad. Half of your shots. Yeah. Now if you. That's the classic way, by the way, to make a group for the internet. Mm. Is you fire a 10 round group and then pick the best five. That is literally that is the accuracy literally. standard for the Germans. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, it's a flyer, it's a flyer. Um, luckily, the, the, what, what they do is they explain to us the, the statistics of this, and uh, if you double the radius, you get 94% of, sh of shots. So if you fire 20 rounds, you'd expect 19 of them into that. So you're expecting 19 of 20 rounds into a 40 centimeter group at 330 yards. Which is going to be 16 inches at 300, which is a little over a five minute of angle group. Yeah, and that, and that is what they're considering normal. Now to bring it back to sniper rifles, uh, the number four T's all had to pass a shooting test of seven out of seven shots into five inches at 200 yards, which is two and a half mower. Okay. The Germans seem to have made little attempt to select particularly accurate rifles at the factory, and they would just pull rifles off the rack and slap a scope on them. That's what the Japanese did. 
And that's what I think most probably did. I, think the, I don't know about the Russians, but then I don't read Russian, so I can't look at original sources. I suspect the intent was that this rifle isn't there to be more accurate. It's there so that the soldier can see targets yes. to engage them, because that is the biggest shortcoming of an iron-sided rifle. Mm. You, we guarantee you can't, it doesn't matter how accurate the rifle is, you can't hit it if you can't see it. Yeah, and that's certainly the point of the ZF-41, the little 1.5 right. power. Um, that's a hugely underappreciated scope. Yeah. I really like those things. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Cooper invented it, didn't you know? I'm sure. Well, yeah. he thought so. <laughs> Sorry, I've just, I've just blasphemed against the saint. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, effectively, um, if you're interested in uh, Co 98K Snipers, buy Steve Law's collector grade book. It's, it's yeah. worth the money. His translations from German, when I read them, I have to sort of literally translate them back into German to work out what was <laughs> what, what, what he actually what, meant what he actually meant yeah um but otherwise they're they're, they're excellent books and uh, he is a man as a fanboy but he doesn't hide the warts okay uh and one of the warts in there is that the germans were distinctly unhappy with the accuracy of their <laughs> sniper rifles and there were reports coming back from the sniper schools believe if i remember correctly still in the day when they were issuing zf-41s as sniper rifles mm -hmm. Um, saying, look, these rifles are on average capable of six inch groups, even with even with the special shooting in am ammunition. I'm like, what's going on? Wow. What are you doing? Um, and then in the Russian campaign, they were coming up with mo coming up against Mosin against sniper rifles. And anyone that's ever fired a Mosin sniper rifle with good ammunition should know that they're not bad for the standards of the day. Yeah. For the standards of today. <laughs> But for back in the day, they were very, very good. And the Germans were kind of jealous. <laughs> to the point at which, post D-Day, and Steve Law actually has uh, the front page of the letter written to Mauser saying, look, guys, we want a new sniper rifle. Uh, we want your pre-production models to do 60 millimeters at 100 meters so that your production ones will do 70, and that roughly comes out about two and a half mower. So it's basically, we want something that is as good as a number four T. Um, it has to be a repeater, but otherwise do what you want, and if you want to change the caliber, you can change the caliber. Wow. Which is like, you're in the middle of the t of total war. That really highlights how, how bad they, they, what they had was, and how much they really wanted something that would just yeah. shoot straight. The, 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 they were assess they assess them as on average because there's always exceptions. Everything's on a bell curve. Right. Like I'm not saying that there's not there's not there Words. weren't any that were freaking laser beams. Words to live by. There are always exceptions. Yeah. Everything's on a bell curve. Um, that they were capable at 300 meters. They were capable of on average engaging the uh, the chest target, but not the head target. And uh, that is from one of the bad translations of Steve Law translated back into German and then back into proper English. <laughs> it really helps It really helps reading these books if you can speak a bit of German, or at least more than Steve Law could, because he did his own translations. And damn to damn Europeans. Uh, sorry. There's, there's nothing like feeling stupid when you only speak one language and you're around people who speak like four. <laughs> mm. That might be the Scotch. That might be speaking. Oh. Well, we are going a bit long here, but we still have one more to go. A Which very is British one. So God Save the Queen and the various versions of the Mad Minute myth. Oh. And uh, for, for which Mr. Ian Hogg and the Osprey publishing uh, series bear a lot of responsibility. Yeah. Now, uh, this is something, if you're interested in giving it loads of the bolt action rifle, I do a certain amount of that. On my channel, go look at British Muzzle Loaders as well. Rob, mm. Rob's very much into this. Yep, very uh, cool channel. Very very cool channel. Very much. Go 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 watch his videos. Um, he's very much into the drill and the uniforms as well, mm -hmm. which uh, is less of my yeah, interest but, beyond the ergonomics. But it looks great on video. It does look great on video. Yeah. That kilt, that kilt. Can, what is it with Canadians and kilts? Well, I have a kilt. You have a kilt. Yeah. I started playing the bagpipes when I was 10 years old. Cool. Yeah. Kilts are fantastic. I won't ask any further questions. <laughs> um, British muzzle loaders and I both know it. So Indeed, I have never, despite having a Scottish surname, which I will not reveal, um, I have never knowingly worn a kilt. 
McPlug. McPlug. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Um, yes, there's various versions of this. Shall I start with the reality of the myth? Let's go with the myth. Let's go with the myth. Definitely. There's so many versions of the myth. Uh, the classic one, which I believed because it was in all the books, uh, was that uh, British professional soldiers, infantry, cavalry, uh, pre World War One had to shoot at least 15 aimed rounds a minute at 300 yards for their pay, at least 15 rounds a minute. There's the Ian Hogg version of the myth that comes up an awful lot, which is that they had to shoot 15 rounds a minute, or more than 15 rounds a minute, on a 12 inch target at 300 yards. Now, to be fair, this does mesh really quite well with what we were just talking about with the British Army of this exact time being very serious about its mm. marksmanship standards. However, the Mad Minute kind of got distorted in books, and then it's gotten seriously distorted mm. by the internet. And then you get people arguing that it couldn't have been true that British soldiers shot 15 aimed rounds in a minute because we'll take a straw man argument based on one of these stupid myth versions, and yeah, the Ian Hogg version of the myth, that's the mechanical accuracy of the rifle leaving the factory and in service as the wood gets heated yeah, and totally cooled. Go down. It's never going to get any better. Um, the reality is that to be classed marksman or first class shot, second class shot, or, third, or whatever, there was a whole series of practices of which practice 22 was rapid, was, fire. Was rapid fire. It was 15 rounds in a minute at 300 yards, starting five rounds in the gun, the rest in the pouches. Um, and it was on a 48 inch target frame and the highest scoring zone was 24 inches and the aiming mark which is it's not quite a square it's sort of very stylized guy in a sort of victorian flat helmet thing yeah. um that's roughly 12 by 12 inches that's where ian hogg got his and that's where ian hogg got his 12 by 12 but it's not the target that's 12 by 12 it's the aiming mark yeah the equivalent of the black not the outermost aiming ring Quite a round American bullseye target. Yeah, and, and, and that's where it comes from. And I'm a glutton for punishment, and every so often I, I get a core digest, and during my lunch break, sometimes I'll go through it and it'll have things like this. I just think, oh, no. <laughs> no. I've seen people. Now, the other thing, the other myth about this that is, I think the one that I see more often is mm. that there was the Mad Minute, and it was this fantastic British standard. Mm. And what it meant was that every soldier could make 39 hits. <laughs> on that target in a minute, right? <laughs> you get that too, right? You see we that. get that, we get, we get. Yeah. Um, because like the best guy to ever on record, and this was some like, you know, senior gunnery sergeant who'd been in the service for 85 if years. If he even existed. No, oh, is there, that would be even better if he it's never even existed. Snox, it's the, it's, it's um, Sergeant Instructor Snoxall. Okay. 38 rounds in a minute. Yes, okay. 38. No. See, that's what happens on the internet. It's, that's what it's, happens. Now it's 40. <laughs> yeah. um, the thing is, we don't even know if Snoxall really existed. That's the thing. There's no record of him. And, and a shooter that good would have probably been competing as well. You would think so, yeah. You think so. So his name would probably be up in the uh, Army Rifle Association uh, busily on prize boards and things. There isn't. There is Jesse Wallingford, who did 36. Allegedly, I believe that Jesse Wallingford was a real shooter, was an Olympic shooter. Hmm. He was a seriously good all round shot and uh, was at Gallipoli and won medals for bravery and for extreme feats of marksmanship against moving targets <laughs> uh, with rifle, revolver, and machine gun. Huh. General, a, a super, super shot all round. And apparently an all-round good egg, which is the most hmm. important thing when oh, one is no. British. <laughs> um, but, but that doesn't mean everyone could do it. No. It seems to have been... The, 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 the unlimited rounds mad minute seems to have been largely an instructor demo right. to calm the troops down who are worried about 15 rounds being a lot. Now, if you're a German and your doctrine is 8 to 10 rounds a minute, uh, which is not in any of the manuals, I found it somewhere else, <laughs> Um, then 15 rounds might seem like a bit of a bit of a stretch, but uh, in some of the later rifle training manuals, particularly the, the 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 1955 one I've got, they said that to give everyone confidence, they should they, they should get the best the best shooter, the best rapid fire shooter mm -hmm. available, who can shoot at least 20, to show that you can easily exceed 15. That in makes a minute. sense. 
perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. And the Second World War and later exercise to say ammo, they did. They did actually. They didn't do fifteen in a minute. They did uh, ten in forty seconds with a hmm. with a five round start. Uh, pre First World War, it was indeed fifteen in a minute. But it's the same. The same rate of fire. Right. It seems to have been an instructor demo to show. Don't worry, it's easy. Don't worry, it's easy. We can do twenty five. So you doing fifteen is easy. Right. And honestly, when you're used to rapid firing, fifteen is. That's that bad. Not that bad. Yeah. It's kind of literally. If you have a if you have a stoppage, if you have an issue, you screw up. Then you're toast. Then you're toast. Right. If you take fifteen seconds to clear a stoppage because you've screwed up a charger or 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 something, uh, you're toast. Right. You're gonna you're gonna end up rushing it, but um, fifteen aimed rounds, well aimed rounds in a minute, is in and it only training. takes one observer, you know, some foreign American German French observer mm. watching one unit go through its training, who watches one of these expert instructors get thirty rounds in a minute, mm -hmm. and goes, my goodness, yeah, and writes a newspaper article which then becomes the only thing his entire readership has ever heard about British training because yep. they don't have the internet, because uh, it didn't exist. Yep. And all of a sudden now, the story starts to spread about how every man in the British Army can fire 30 rounds, or maybe, was it? I think it was 40 rounds, mm. in a minute at a 5-inch target at 600 meters. Yeah, it, it gets inflated very, very, right. very quickly. I mean, Wikipedia says the, the, the Austro-Hungarians with the M95 Mannlicher could, uh, typically could fire 35 rounds a minute. <laughs> I'm going to test this. I have an M95. <laughs> I was like... That is the most uncomfortable gun, bolt gun, I have ever fired. <laughs> And anyone willing to fire 35 rounds in a minute is both out of their mind and has my most sincere respect. And I'm pretty sure they don't exist. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> like, I'm going to try this. I'd never heard of that one. It's all, uh, it was, I was looking at stuff on the, on the pretty new rifle I'd bought, and I was just like, no, no way. That's, no. That's insane. Yeah. Now, you, in there, you pointed out to me the, the German standard for rapid fire. Oh, yes. Yeah, which was... I can. I remember this. I, okay. This made an impression on me. You start prone with the front sight at eye level and the butt on the ground, so slightly dropped. And on command, you have seven seconds to make one shot. Sharpshooter class, so third year. Yeah, that's the highest level of of training. And we are seven seconds. That's it is at three hundred for the for the sharpshooter class. It is at mm -hmm. three hundred meters. You do it five times. You can repeat three shots. So you actually get eight rounds if you need yeah. them. And you need to make five hits and 33 points. On a target that goes up to 12. 12. And it's, uh, it's 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters, 40 centimeters, with 12 being 10 centimeters. And that's it. Yeah. Now that's not a super easy string. But when um, you think of that as basically the highest level of qualification and training, that's not, not all that. That's really not all that. And, yeah. and, and when you've got the, the, the Brits on the other side who are all practicing 10 rounds in 40 seconds with a reload in there and expecting... Well, the Brits didn't have the universal machine gun. No, we had a light machine gun and a medium machine gun. Yeah. And the, and the definition of medium machine gun is something for an entirely separate mm. video because that's a ball, ball of worms all one that's a can of worms that's a yes it's definitely the scotch speaking that's a can <laughs> of worms all to itself uh, yeah, it so well, that was cool that was uh, that cool. let us get a bunch of stuff off our chests to anyone who survived this far jolly good show <laughs> we really appreciate you watching this far into a video of us sitting in a room bitching about guns <laughs> <laughs> about myths it's been yeah, fantastic yeah um it was really cool to be able to hook up and Definitely. Do some cool video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Yep. Um, if you did, well, if you're watching this early, you're seeing it on Bloke's channel, definitely check out his Patreon account. Um, I think he does really cool content, and he deserves to have a lot more support and a lot more viewers than he does. So, of course, if you're already watching this, you probably already know that. So if you're not watching this super early, if you're seeing it on Forgotten Weapons, uh, the same thing applies. Definitely uh, check out his channel and all the very cool info he has. And... Uh, well, if you're at it, you might also take a look at my Patreon account. I um, did. Yeah, it, you did, indeed. Um, that is what allows me to travel to places like Switzerland, where we are now, uh, to find some cool guns and bring you those, and do some cool collaboration with guys like Bloke on the Range. So, thank you very much for watching. Thanks. <laughs>